Calling the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the Budget and Finance Committee of the Rec Centers of Sun City West. Um, we have established a quorum. The only member who is not here today is Kathy Lindahl. She was not able to be here um, in person or remote. Uh, the minutes from our last meeting, which was September 21st, have been distributed to everyone. Do we have any changes, corrections, additions from anyone on the committee? If not, do I have consensus to accept these as written? Thank you. I do want to welcome two new members who were not with us at our last meeting. Uh, first of all, on the far right is Anita DeGumbia. Many of you may know Anita, who is a former board member of the rec centers. And uh, she was in, uh, was it Michigan earlier? Wisconsin. Wisconsin, one of those states up there. Yeah, part of the city, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and Anita will be a member of our committee this year. And another new member is Richard Tornabene. Tornabene. And uh, Richard, uh, tell us a little bit about, you've been in Sun City West how long? Okay, so we're happy to have Richard with us. Don, you're making, oh, Richard, you need to, you'll need to, when you talk, you'll need to turn it on. There we go. The little thing in the middle, yeah. Good enough. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Don, for that heads up. Um, we're going to start this morning with a presentation from Cap Trust, and we have, um, uh, representatives of CAP Trust here. I want to just give a little background on CAP Trust and, and the whole process. Last year, a large portion of the time we spent on budget and finance was finding an investment advisor. We realized that we needed to ensure that we were following our directions, which um, one of them was that preservation of capital is our main goal and that led to us changing our mix of um, bonds and equities from 60-40 to 90-10. Um, and the other thing we needed to do was ensure that we had a professional investment advisor. To that end, we had uh, three members of our committee, John Holbold being one of them, who drew up an RFQ, put out a re, um, um, request for um, people who might want to uh, serve as an investment advisor for us. I believe we got eight responses. We talked with those people. We narrowed it down to four. When we had the final interview, Frank Piles and his uh, team with Cap Trust uh, were the ones who were head and shoulders above the others. We had really good responses. I don't think we could have gone wrong with any of the final four, but um, Cap Trust definitely was the one that we all agreed on, those of us who were on the selection committee. So I will turn it over now to you, Frank and Nathan, to uh, do your presentation. And I'm gonna suggest we may wanna move over to the sides to get out of the way while they do their presentation. Do I need to adjust the mic or is this okay? Good? Okay. Thank you, everybody. It's nice to see everyone's face. I didn't expect this big of a room this morning. Uh, my name is Frank Piles. I'm here representing Cap Trust. My colleague, Nathan Erickson, is with me, and I'll give uh, Nathan the opportunity to uh, do a quick hello and in and, and bio, uh, and then I'll maybe ask him so you don't have to stand there the whole time. Maybe you can take a seat uh, as you'll be covering the second half of the presentation. Then we'll walk through a brief agenda of what we hope to talk about today and then uh, certainly leave it open for, for Q&A. So we'll, we'll try to keep this to 15 or 20 minutes. Um, but my name is Frank Piles. Again, I've been in the uh, financial industry for a little over 20 years. Uh, was the primary contact working with um, Pete and Ann and Bill over the course of the RFQ process. Uh, incredibly insightful and um, very helpful in getting us through that process. And, and ultimately, we're, we're very thankful to have been selected. So I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, uh, Nathan Erickson, I've been with CapTrust about 12 years. I was part of a firm locally that was acquired uh, a little over a year ago, and I primarily work in the uh, research function, uh, but work with clients as well. All right. 
So I'm going to cover the, the first half of the presentation here and um, really just give everyone a, a chance to learn a little bit more about CAP Trust. Please feel free to interrupt me along the way if anyone has any questions. We'll talk about where we are in the transition. There was a, a, a process of converting the uh, account from Vanguard to um, the current location where we're, we're custodying and trusting it. We'll talk a little bit about the um, uh, portfolio, both from a, a presentation perspective and an actual implementation perspective. And then Nathan's going to go a little deeper in kind of helping look around the corner. So not just kind of how has the market been, but what do we expect uh, from the market going forward? And we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, some headwinds and tailwinds that we think may be impactful or important to know about as you think about your portfolio in the coming 12 months. Oh, hey there. That was quick. Let me see if I can go back and do that again. Sorry, Richard. I'm trying to control from here. I think I might have held the button down a little bit too much. Okay, Cap Trust. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Cap Trust. We're actually the nation's largest registered investment advisor. We've been around uh, for over 35 years. Um, we're approaching now, I think um, that number changes every day. I think we're closer to 1,000 employees now. But we oversee about 2,800 institutional relationships, about $630 billion. One of the things that we um, champion or pride ourselves on is the fact that we don't sign long-term contracts with our clients. So every 30 days, it automatically renews. So we have to keep proving our value to ensure that we're kept around for the long term. And we feel good about the fact that we've had a 98% client retention rate going back to 2009. You can see offices all over the country. Um, Phoenix, Arizona is one of the latest additions. Um, we're focused exclusively in the institutional cons consulting space as a primary function. We do also do uh, some wealth management, but predominantly what we're doing uh, is advice in the following areas. So I won't read these to you, but just to give you kind of a, a broad brush uh, look at what Cap Trust is all about. And a little bit more, so again, 35 years, the Cap Trust office, uh, to which Nathan had alluded to, was um, acquired last year, had been around for over 30 years, uh, a household name for many organizations in the Valley. Um, the icons that you're seeing on the screen are just some of the, the names that uh, are current clients of our Phoenix office, uh, including Hospice of the Valley, um, Valley of the Sun United Way, Phoenix Suns Charities, Arizona Diamondbacks, Ballet Arizona, just to name a few. So talk a little bit about the transition. So for Anne and uh, Bill and Pete, this is something they've been seeing the entire time. Uh, really the answer here is uh, we're done. We're on the far right hand side. We feel really good about the fact that we've gone through the entire process, uh, both from a, um, an engagement perspective all the way through consulting. And now we're actually in the implementation phase. The account is live. The uh, assets are invested according to the bylaws and policies, which I should note. Um, Pete pointed out to me uh, that, that there is a differentiation between bylaws and policies. I've, I've tended to use them interchangeably, so you may see the word bylaw on here when, in fact, it's probably more realistic uh, to call it a policy. So one thing you can expect, and uh, Pete has already seen some of this, um, quarterly reporting. So we publish a, a, an entire suite of resources that we share with our clients on a quarterly basis. Uh, because of our size, we do all of our research in-house. We don't rely on third parties. So there's going to be a combination of um, self-published um, uh, resources and asset um, allocation outlooks and economic outlooks, some of which we're going to go through today. Uh, top left-hand corner is just a sample of the statement that, that Pete was able to draw down just recently uh, at quarter end. So portfolio implementation, as Ann mentioned, it was critical with the uh, change from a 60-40 policy to a 10-90 uh, equity to fixed income that we looked across the spectrum for the best investments available. Um, Cap Trust does not have any products, so we don't represent any Cap Trust funds or um, anything like that. So we can truly um, be unleashed and use the entire universe of, of investment options out there to choose to build a portfolio. Um, in aggregate, you can see uh, some of the names that we've selected for this particular portfolio being Fidelity Schwab, iShares, um, to, to name a few. Uh, incredibly low costs, about a $29 million portfolio, uh, average expenses around six basis points or 0.06%, um, roughly about $16,000 in investment costs annually. 
uh, and that's compliant with the scratch out bylaw policy on fund diversification requirements of 20% maximum per holding. This is what we targeted. This is what we actually implemented. Um, I can go back for and forth for you, but basically the answer here is it's nearly identical. The only thing that's represented on the actual that was not represented on the target is the very top line, which is a Dreyfus Insured Deposits, which is really just a cash fund where we catch dividends and then we can use it to opportunistically invest in areas where we feel like there may be an advantage to do so. It's a de minimis amount, but uh, something worth noting as uh, the totals and targets are, are off by just a few basis points relative to what the target implementation was. I'll pause right there. Questions about anything thus far and how we got to where we are? So this is the actual asset allocation uh, and projected income, which uh, Pete and I had a good discussion about. We actually think that's probably a little underestimated. Um, the account had only been live about 30 days when we took this snapshot. And I think there may just be some time necessary to um, capture the investment allocation to really more accurately report the um, estimated income. Um, the tool that we use, Pershing, or the provider that we use, has estimated about $18,000 per month, or roughly $215,000 to $220,000 annually. Uh, Pete and I put our heads together and, and estimate that's probably um, uh, close to half of what we actually think it will be, and this will smooth out over time as the portfolio is in place a little bit longer. I'm going to transition to Nathan to talk a little bit about the market commentary and things that we see on the horizon. Yeah, so on a quarterly basis when we meet with the committee, we'll provide our, our views on the market really to frame the portfolio and give you a sense of, you know, what's driven performance and what do we see as we look ahead. Um, this is hot off the presses. Frank and I just, uh, you know, got our update from the, the CIO in the last few days, but... Um, Generally, if you look at the third quarter in terms of, of overall markets, it was mixed for the most part. Um, most equity markets were muted, uh, maybe slightly down. You can see that with the, the shaded bars on the chart there. Um, fixed income was relatively flat. Um, and then you had real estate and commodities, which there isn't any of that in the portfolio, um, which were positive for the quarter. But on a full year basis, everything's done fairly well, with the exception of emerging markets on the equity side and then fixed income, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, yeah, if you look a little bit deeper into stocks and bonds, you can look at certain sectors that have done well, highlighted on the bottom left there, what, what performed well in the quarter. Um, we might focus more on the year to date, but generally within our portfolio, we have a bit of a small value uh, exposure in the equities, which is again, only 10% of the portfolio, uh, and that's done well for the full year. Um, you know, we think going forward, given the economic conditions, it should be a, a positive area. I'll point out, and I'll see if this laser pointer will work. Um, fixed income, if you look at the 10-year yield, you know, a dramatic change from uh, a year ago where we were at about 70 basis points on a 10-year treasury, today about 150 basis points, which is why over the last 12 months you've seen 10-year treasury returns down about 6%. If you dissect the fixed income, which is 90% of the portfolio, we have a shorter duration, and so we're a little bit insulated from that, that type of activity. Uh, but certainly there is, has been risk in fixed income this year, um, and we'll see you know, how the economic conditions play out as far as what it looks like over uh, the coming quarters. We typically produce um, this page on a quarterly basis just to give you a sense of what are head, headwinds we see in the economy, tailwinds as well. Um, you've probably all seen the news about um, you know, the supply chain backup, we're calling it a logistics log jam, uh, but the number of container ships that are sitting outside the port of Los Angeles unable to deliver because you can't get uh, workers, um, you know, or, or uh, truck drivers to move those goods. So, so that's a potential headwind to the economy if you're not getting those goods transmitted into the, into the broader economy. There's still a big labor issue, so you've got a lot of open positions, more open positions than available workers. Um, some of that we think has been driven by, um, you know, the extended unemployment benefits, which should end, which ended in September. So hopefully that re releases some more people who <laughs> want to work and take some of those jobs. Um, some interesting data, if you look under the hood there, but um, 
you know, a number of, of uh, people who have left the workforce are, are, are working women who can't find childcare because, again, we have labor issues as well. So uh, almost, they love to work, but they, they can't uh, find ways to, to find childcare for their, for their family. Um, and then, uh, you know, if we look at political policy outlook, we're, we're still waiting on, on what the final um, infrastructure bill looks like coming out of Congress and, and what that you know, incorporates in terms of tax, uh, tax law changes that could also be a headwind for the economy as well. And then uh, lastly, a lot of activity in China. I showed you the emerging markets performance that's, that's negative for the year, uh, but some of the actions that they're taking and the impact on the broader economy. From a tailwind standpoint, you know, the economy is still strong, particularly when you look at household wealth, and I'll show you a slide on that. People have a lot of buying power, um, so there's people ready to spend money, um, and monetary policy remains supportive. So there's still, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is, is continuing to provide support to ensure that, that markets are liquid and operating well. Inflation's another big topic that we've talked about. We are seeing some wage inflation. Again, if you have open positions and you can't get people to fill them, you can try to incent them by raising the, the uh, wage that you're willing to pay. Um, that, that is something that we're keeping an eye on because it potentially bleeds through into you know, the cost of goods and services over the long term. So if uh, inflation picks up, you know, that, that's something that um, we're keeping an eye on as well. I mentioned the logistics aspect. An interesting chart here on the left, you can see how much it costs to ship something from Shanghai to Los Angeles, pretty stable through the years until you get to 2021 where it's you know, dramatically higher, $14,000 uh, to move a container versus roughly 2,000. And, and then I mentioned household wealth as well. You can see the, the growth in household wealth uh, and, and tappable home equity. So this is becoming more and more popular. People taking out home equity lines of credit, particularly with interest rates as, as low as they are. And then finally, you know, as it relates to the strength in the economy, we've seen productivity increase dramatically uh, within companies. Really, margins have expanded, uh, which is flowing through to earnings per share, which is why, you know, we, we continue to see strong U.S. stock market performance. Um, I think if you look back to 2009, we've had one negative year uh, in that time period. So really 11 out of 12 positive years uh, since 2009, which is quite remarkable. So again, we'll provide this commentary on a regular basis uh, to the committee. We'll uh, inform you if we think some of these developments uh, warrant changes in the portfolio or adjustments, um, you know, given what we see. Any questions? One thing I might ask you to talk about is um, you just mentioned the market's been up nine of the last 10 years, interest rates aren't as low as they've been in a long, long time. Is there a possibility of seeing kind of a double whack with an equity correction along with rising interest rates and a negative impact on portfolios that are heavily invested in fixed income? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's on everyone's mind is how much longer can the U.S. stock market continue at this pace? Um, you've heard, probably heard comments about high valuations. So the market's trading at a high multiple to the earnings that it's producing. Um, but yet we've continued to have an accom accommodative Fed and, and uh, government policy. So, you know, it's hard to predict. I think, you know, that, that those thoughts have been around for the last several years. How much longer can the U.S. stock market continue? Um, it's 10% of the portfolio. And frankly, if, if your portfolio were 100% bonds, I would say that's riskier than at least having 10% in equities because they, they are uncorrelated and they can move in opposite directions. So it's good to have some equity exposure in the portfolio. You know, on the, on the fixed income side, uh, we, we think the risk there is high. And, and, you know, if you want to look at it from a valuation standpoint, it's as expensive, potentially more expensive than the stock market. Um, but, you know, interest rates tend to need catalysts to move. And, and right now things are, are relatively um, stable. I think, you know, Inflation is probably the biggest potential risk on the fixed income side. Uh, if you start to see inflation pick up a lot, then, then that'll have an impact. But it's why we've kept the portfolio shorter duration. So 
Um, you could see some slight negative returns in fixed income. Uh, and if we think you know, rate, rate increases are gonna be more dramatic, we'd, we'd shorten the duration even more. But, but generally, you know, there's, a, there's a pretty fine trade-off there of saying, well, I wanna avoid the risk of rising interest rates, but I still wanna earn a return. Um, you, know, you can eliminate all interest rate risk, but you'll get nothing on your money. That's the cash position. Um, you can try to maximize your yield, but if rates rise, you know, you're at risk for losses there. So we're trying to tiptoe that line and, and monitor it closely. Um, but, you know, the, the old adage is still true. I mean, you can't make money in a portfolio without taking risk. And I think, you know, I commend your, your finance committee in, in identifying what are the true objectives of this portfolio, capital preservation, and, and coming to a, an allocation that makes sense given that objective. Yes. Is it possible to have a, an estimate of our approximate duration? Yeah, yeah, to repeat the question, if there's anybody on the line to repeat the question was, can we estimate what the approximate duration of the portfolio is? And the answer is yes, we actually, it's 4.7 years. The aggregate bond index is a little over six, 6.2. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a little short of that by design. Um, and it's pure in the sense that it's heavily centered on intermediate fixed income, not the kind of barbell average where you've got a lot of short and a lot of long that average 4.7. It's more pure to the middle. Yes. Um, first off, thank you very much for uh, handling this for us. Um, and I also am very pleased to hear we don't have any 12B1 concerns because that right. was one of my first questions I was going to be <laughs> asking. Um, I noticed there were, I didn't get it, not, a, not very heavy, but currently are into some ETFs. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate us doing any more ETF-type uh, purchases? Uh, or what, what, what is the plan from that perspective? Do you want to take that? Sure. So the purpose of the ETF is it's just a daily traded mutual fund. So intraday, it's a mutual fund, a basket of stocks. But instead of waiting for the valuation at the end of the day, the, the, the basket trades intraday. And there are some providers where the ETF is exactly the same bucket as the mutual fund, but it's cheaper. So our objective here was you have two Teslas, this one's $5,000 cheaper, let's take that one. It's exactly the same basket. So that's the, the, the real holistic reason behind the, the ETF. So the answer is, Yes, we could use more ETFs, but I, I don't know that we anticipate making any changes to the portfolio anytime soon. Any other questions from the committee so far or audience? Is anyone awake? No, I'm just kidding. We usually get that. We're finance people, so. Nothing like market commentary at nine in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you next quarter. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Frank and Nathan. I really appreciate you being here. And I might add that as part of their service, they have offered to do education not only for the Budget and Finance Committee, but also for the Governing Board. So um, we'll be discussing that and seeing what we may need to, to talk with you all about as far as some future education. So thank you very much. Next up, uh, Pete Finelli is going to talk about the Vanguard quarterly performance. Vanguard was our former um, repository for our funds. We also had uh, some uh, smaller amount at J.P. Morgan, is that correct? And um, those are now all with Cap Trust. Thank you, Ann. Um, so Vanguard and Andy Maslick used to present quarterly by the policy of the rec centers. Um, we anticipate that Cap Trust will do the same as, as Ann alluded to. This uh, was dated August 31st before the transfer occurred on around September 9th. Um, just the only item in here I wanted to highlight was uh, this right here. It's, I know it's kind of hard to read, but 
this is the actual performance of the funds um, that, that Vanguard oversaw. And then down here is the benchmark broken up in this manner here. And uh, you can see over, particularly over the last year, uh, they've been outperforming the broader market. And so, um, you know, uh, it, they did well for us. And um, I always wanted to, you know, recognize that uh, 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 Vanguard has, you know, uh, a very low, you know, expense ratios and um, broadly uh, diversified with thousands and thousands of funds. So they did a lot of the diversification that, uh, that I think is in line with the preservation of capital policy. But uh, if there are not any questions, uh, I'll move on from that. But uh, thank you. Pete, Pete's going to be next on the agenda sure. also to review the uh, financials for August and September. So the first item is that uh, you normally don't uh, have two months. You can anticipate that uh, the second BNF of every month you will be seeing two, uh, excuse me, the uh, financial presentation. Uh, a brief uh, update on August, and then I'll concentrate more on year to date when I put the September slide up. In the upper left-hand corner, the revenues, you'll see this both in September and August. Uh, generally speaking, we're seeing positive uh, environment to the budget and in, in the golf fees. And just for those that are new, the golf fees is simply the greens fees. The uh, ancillary is where the uh, cart fees and the range balls occur, and the growth of golf has uh, both those have exceeded. Uh, the bowling has been a pleasant surprise. League bowling has been up and. Uh, we had a positive environment there in August, and you'll see in a few minutes uh, that September is as well. And lastly, uh, an identifier that the um, popularity and the positive outcome of the Lizard Acres conversion has been generating a significant uh, food and beverage. This is, as we put very uh, noted within the uh, statement, it is at net, which is to say that the revenue minus the cost of goods sold are reflected here any of the salary that's associated with it would remain down in the, uh, in the, and the utilities would be down in the operating expense portion. So overall, about an $80,000 favorable variance in our budget for the revenues. Uh, we have had uh, uh, significant openings within our uh, golf maintenance, and also there was a little quirk within our budgeting for uh, the uh, OPA starter, or excuse me, the uh, player assistant positions. Uh, when I looked at it a little closer, it looked like we and we put the uh, uh, player assistance uh, expense over the entire 12 month period. When the reality is, um, they don't start up until a week ago. So, part of that positive variance is the numerous uh, courses that have those player assistants. So. This will start to dwindle as we get closer to the, or as we enter into the remainder of the year. Utilities has been an also a nice surprise. The cooler temperatures, the initiatives that uh, Carl Wilhelm in particular has made uh, over the last two years that I've been here in our uh, energy savings initiatives uh, have resulted in considerable savings on the uh, utilities uh, at the rec centers. The next two are very highly variable. Uh, repairs and landscape maintenance. Uh, I will note in a second that uh, specifically in landscape maintenance, which predominantly is four items, the most notable you're going to remember uh, being seed and the impact that the governing board approved for uh, the seed excess. Uh, that uh, started to play itself out in September, so it was uh, good to have a positive variance before we hit that, uh, that headwind. The rest of them are pretty immaterial, so overall, a favorable variance on the expenses, coupled with the 80,000 gap, uh, so our operating margin was uh, about 285 ahead of budget. Uh, down in capital related, pretty benign on the uh, incomes and the uh, investment uh, valuations, but uh, a nice strong performance within our uh, asset preservation fees. Uh, I think that's somewhere like 26 more transactions than uh, budgeting. 
So if you don't have any questions for August, uh, I'll move on to September and maybe we can answer any questions there as well. Any, any questions on August from the committee? So it's gonna sound a little bit like a broken record, but uh, September, uh, same variances, uh, you know, in terms of where the positive or other impacts occurred, roughly 77,000 favorable variants. You can start to see that when the uh, September overseeding and the, uh, some of the positions started to come back in golf, that narrowed and you're gonna probably see that through the rest of the, of the year. Still a positive environment, utilities for the same reason. And now the, the most notable one is we had about two thirds of our seed component did hit within the uh, overseeding that started in September. And so that positive environment that I was talking about is going to take some impact, but year to date, uh, we're still in a positive environment, which is very good to see as we enter October. We're uh, about, a, I think we're gonna have about $100,000 remaining hit on the seed. So uh, it won't be, at least at this juncture, won't be as dramatic as we were anticipating. The rest of them, again, are relatively benign. Uh, you can ask any questions, of course, but this time uh, with the uh, seed component, uh, we did have a slight deficit on uh, overage on the expense side, and so our operating margin is uh, still favorable. Uh, so that's, that's good news. Uh, in the month of uh, September, I mentioned that we did convert to uh, CapTrust, so any of the uh, investments that had occurred over time uh, were actually realized. Uh, that means nothing, though, as a tax-exempt entity, and whatever, you know, uh, position we did on the uh, realized side was just offset on the unrealized side. However, as they mentioned in the uh, meeting or in their presentation, some of the uh, short-term uh, interest rates have, and the Treasury in particular have gone up in the last month. And, uh, and so there was about a $300,000 market valuation decline in September. Um, APFs remain strong. Um, so overall capital, with in particular with the uh, realized portion, did have a deficit of 286. So there was uh, a 263,000 uh, shortfall as we uh, posted for our September. Positive environment overall and year to date. The 80, 80 that I just mentioned in the last two months coupled with July were sitting favorably for the same reasons in, uh, in the revenue side. Same functionality down here, 354. So the operating margin sitting very well right now at uh, 581 favorable. Uh, down here on the, uh, on the capital related, uh, even though we had the 300,000 shortfall in that, we had had about a 200,000 favorable uh, in July and August. So year to date, uh, an $80,000 uh, deficit in our val market valuations. APFs remain very strong. We're up. 60 and we have a budgeted pace of 100 a month in all three months, uh, we've exceeded that. So this has been very favorable. Overall then the capital related still positive 52,000. So at this juncture through three months, uh, we have a $633,000 revenues over expenses. And a brief synopsis against prior year, doing well uh, in I guess a broad spectrum of of uh, the operating revenues. Reminder that we are doing that with, without any increase in our dues or our golf fees or bowling fees. Uh, predominantly this is be the return of guest fees and tenant cards and transfer fees. Uh, golf has remained strong. Bowling, as I mentioned earlier, is very good. And for the most part, the uh, Lizard Acre contribution down there. Expense management, I think, has been managed very well despite a, a, a you know, a compression of expenses on the, uh, on the uh, wage side uh, that, that they were bringing up. Uh, we've maintained uh, roughly uh, about a two or two and a half percent uh, increase. Uh, utilities um, still perform very well, which is extremely good. Um, these are all relatively in a narrow bandwidth. So overall, our, our favorable environment about 159,000 ahead of prior year. Uh, just a real quick, it was hard to replicate the prior year, but the uh, investment income in the V-shaped recovery through the first three months last year, we're on a, a, 
pretty high incline, so it was going to be hard to replicate that. So of the 888 grand, this is by far the, the biggest component of it. I'm more uh, uh, pleased uh, from an operational side since this is uh, very highly variable. Uh, this is functionally uh, showing the strength of the association and the desire by, in our opinion, people to want to be in this community is the strength of the APFs. And, over year over year, that's looking very good. So we did have a deficit, 99% of it's uh, related to the capital component, but the operating margin uh, remains in a favorable environment. So that's uh, my presentation, any questions? Uh, Pete, have we started seeing any of the uh, asset preservation fees from the new Four Seasons development? We have, uh, there, there are two components to that. The, uh, there was a facilities investment fee that was about 23000 by terms of a contract. We did receive that. I think that we posted in October. And similarly, I think the first occupancy on the KO complex was uh, also recorded in August, October. But we have about, by last I heard, I thought we had close to mid-teens were already in some level of contract. Okay, excellent. I might want to point out for the rest of the committee and uh, the audience, too, when Pete talks about the grass seed issue, um, we had to have a special board meeting um, in July to address the fact that the price of our grass seed had risen tremendously. And I learned more about grass seed than I ever thought I was going to learn about golf courses. <laughs> but um, it was... Um, brought to our attention, it was very expeditious that we went ahead and we approved the additional that was not in the budget, but in doing so, we were able to lock in an excellent price to get our seed that we would need for this year. And um, as golf operations explained to us, this should help us keep our courses in excellent condition through the winter. And that may not happen with all the surrounding courses in this area. So there's a good chance that we're going to be among the preferred courses in the West Valley for people who are looking for places to play. And with that, we hope to keep our golf revenue going great guns this year. And with that will come some of the ancillary revenue. And uh, that's always good for us and good for our community. So thank you. Thank you to our golf operations for being ahead of the curve on that. Any other questions? Yes, Anita and then John. Quick question. When exactly did CAP1 take over? Do we uh, have an exact date? Well, first of all, CAP Trust is the investment advisor. So just so we're real clear on, on nomenclature, the funds are invested actually with Pershing slash the uh, Bank of New, uh, Mellon Bank of New York. So that when you hear the actual... Uh, location of where the funds are held, you're going to hear me say Pershing slash Mellon. Okay. The investment advisor is Cap Trust. Uh, they, they were, uh, the funds were changed on September 9th predominantly. About a week later, the mature maturity of the CD occurred at J.P. Morgan, and within a day or two after that, we transferred that as well. The reason I'm asking the question is on your Vanguard for 831, it looked like the account balance was just over, just under $26 million. And then according to the sheet CAP1 yeah. has, it looks like we brought in 28.85. Where'd the other 3 million That's come the, from? That's uh, the CD. That Pardon was, me? That was the CD. The with CDs? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. John, you want to come up and use the microphone so we can hear you, please? I bet Anita will share with you. I, I've been I've been vaccinated. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not sure if this question uh, should be directed to Pete or to our uh, general manager. So I'll throw it out there, and uh, and they can pick and choose. Uh, a little bit of a statement is our golf fees have been a great help to our financial performance since probably April or May of 2020. The 2020 performance. I think we can all attribute to the fact that uh, we were all locked down and there were many golfers because that was one of the few activities available to us. It's continuing uh, into this year, which is great. So I'm wondering if there is any factual 
information out there that guide us about whether there is a resurgence in golf that's responsible for this or whether people still stayed hunkered down in Sun City West to a larger degree this last uh, summer. Uh, is there a trend there to more 12 month residents uh, that we should count on or uh, is that gonna likely fade away? And I'm not sure if there is any hard data to help with that. It might be anecdotal, but uh, I'd like to throw it out there and get some informed opinions if, if, if nothing else. Thank you. I, I looked Bill? like Gary wanted to Anybody? ask something and jumped. Gary, maybe your committee, I don't know. Anybody? Well, one of the things that I looked at on your uh, recap, Pete, was the uh, card sales. And uh, I think that's an indicator of confidence and usage mm -hmm. in the future. So all three of the card sales, the Unlimited, the Kachina, and the Coyote, are all up significantly over last year. Yeah, I would agree. So I don't have the June uh, data, but just to put some numericals to, to the strength of of golf. Um, a year ago, 2020, the overall operating margin was approximately a little over a million. Uh, suffered in the last four months of the year from the COVID impact on bowling was shut down and uh, guest fees and um, tenant cards and things like that were all considerably hit. Uh, golf remained at a par level at that point. We did have a a three-week hiatus in there uh, associated with some non-compliance and that factored in there as well. Fast forward to June 30th of 2021, the year-over-year -year change was 17% growth in the rounds played, starting into the 320,000 range up from you know what historically been in the 270, 280 range. Um, that overall income for the operating margin of the uh, of the association was about 2.6. So the growth of a million six, when you break it down into the golf related only, the, all that round play and everything translated into about a, a million seven improvement, million eight in that range in the golf division alone. So almost you could you could make the argument that the entire performance was attributable to golf. So fast forward to your question about, you know, what are we doing uh, relative to the expectation for the coming year? At this juncture budget, if you were to break it down into the, uh, the, the granular of the budget, we did anticipate some level of, you know, having other opportunities and so uh, I think we went back to a 280, 290,000 run rate. Uh, there has been some level of decline year over year. I don't have the specifics, but Pat brings that up at his um, at the golf committee. Year over year, I think we're starting to see four or five percent decline in the rounds play. But encouragingly, we're seeing strength in the outside play in the amount of dollars per round has been holding up stronger than, than the, uh, the prior year and the budget. And so I do think it's just too early to say, but I would, I would make the argument that uh, we didn't keep it on a pace of 320. I think that would have been, in my opinion, a little bit too aggressive. Um, but uh, 290 or 280 is not exactly low either. It, uh, that's above the, you know, a five-year run rate. Well, I, I think, you know, you pointed it out. The question is, will it remain? Uh, there does seem to be a little bit of, of impact against prior year. My instinct is that, uh, uh, well, we did hear one bit of good news that uh, maybe Bill will allude to is that the Canadian border issue does seem to be reaching some level of accessibility where our last year that was, uh, you know, completely not available to them. but. Uh, it's our understanding they will be able to make it down here this year. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just pushing on it a little bit because it's, it's a really important to our economic well-being. 
it, I'm just searching for as much information as there is out there, and I know there might not be as much as I'd like. Bill. Director Brown, thank you. And John, <clears throat> I think um, one of the things that I think we really need to kind of lay claim to is the fact that our golf courses are in pretty good shape. Um, hats off to all of our maintenance team out there that's doing an, an exorbitant amount of work and keeping the golf courses beyond playable. I mean, they are notches above a lot of the golf courses publicly played in and around our area. So that's part of it. Um, but Mr. O'Hara does talk at his, his golf committee meetings with data and statistics from the National Golf Foundation and Arizona Golf Association about overall numbers are rising. So that's good. Millennials, I think, are picking up the game. Um, so I think there's a little bit of an increase in, in golf play, which is good, but we are seriously capitalizing on that. COVID played a big part of it because of the lockdown and people get at least get to get out, breathe some fresh air and exercise and, and not be, uh, you know, the social distancing thing all kind of goes away when you're out on a golf course enjoying yourself. But I really think Sun City West benefits the most really from having seven courses the residents here that uh, own um, play cards that competitively get out there and play in various types of groups, bringing in fixed income to us. Pete mentioned the outside play increases, but I really think, you know, Todd Patty and his team are really to be attributed to um, the quality of these courses that are really bringing people in and wanting people to play. But we keep track of those numbers and we hope they continue to rise. Absolutely. And Thank you, Bill. I just remembered one other one. Um, it's hard to remember this, but we had about 175 days in a row in the last cycle, the FY21, I believe it was from August to late January. We had no measurable rain. And so, you know, no days were washed out. So, you know, it was a nice uh, resurgence of that. And, you know, you can't always count on that. So I do think it was prudent to step it back a little bit and hopefully we'll continue to exceed. Sharon. Uh, do you want my rec card number? Or? No. Okay. I, I didn't know. <laughs> Sharon yeah. had it. She's a direct, uh, um, board just of Just as a comment, at the newcomers uh, that we just had recently, the green team informed me that um, when I went by to talk with them or speak with them, they said that they had about 600 members and now they're up to 958 and having a difficult time getting on to play. So that didn't sound to me like they were losing them. It sounded like they were keeping them and that more were coming in all the time. So I just thought I'd pass that along. Sure. Excellent information. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, uh, the other thing to remember is we get about 2,000 new residents every year uh, through the a a APF uh, sales that we have. So uh, I'm not sure if we track whether or not those are golfers, but if even half of them are, we've traded a lot of people who no longer play golf for hopefully those that do. Any other questions, comments from the board, the audience? Thank you very much, Pete. We're going to go ahead to the capital update from Pete. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. So uh, you see this now we have had, uh, I didn't do an August only, so this is year to date through September. The, uh, for those that are in the audience or new, uh, we have the uh, government board approved amount of just under 5.7 million. We issue purchase orders and that's how we track our status. Uh, at this juncture, sorry, hit the wrong button. This juncture we've issued just over 3.4 million of POs. 3.1 are on that 5.7 million and the remaining on was carry over items. Uh, what we call is closed POs, where the uh, purchase order was issued, all the uh, items or product produced, and the invoice is paid. And at that juncture, we either have a deficit against uh, the PO or the governing board approved amount or a favorable savings. And at this juncture, 374,000 have been completed, and we're on the favorable side ledger of about 26,000. Items that uh, have, uh, we noted that 3.4 million have been initiated. That's a considerable amount of projects that have moved forward. Uh, these are items that have not. I just highlight them as they knock them off one at a time. And in fact, HVACs and, and other ones have actually had some movement. 
And so this is more just an FYI than any kind of um, uh, item to identify. Then uh, uh, 395,000 is approved by the governing board uh, for items that were not anticipated or in those seven categories are there. Uh, another month where we just uh, uh, didn't have a whole, uh, a whole lot of activity. Um, this was, I believe, 19,000 last month, so uh, we still remain at 369 favorable variants, and um, uh, well done so far this year. So then uh, let's move to the reserve funds and the, uh, and the uh, percentage of our fully funded balance. For those that don't know, the fully funded balance is an aggregate of the uh, Reserve study components broken down to um, how much would be potentially needed at any one given time at this juncture. It exited out of FY21 at about 49 million eight. And with inflation of a 3% component, uh, it elevates to like 53,000, 53 million, excuse me. The various components that make up the uh, projection, right now the operating margin which uh, was budgeted at a million four. Right now, we, you saw earlier that we're about 600 ahead. The uh, earnings off of the uh, reserve funds, you saw earlier that they were conservatively saying about 240,000, I believe. In fact, we did see the earnings already from the Pershing slash Cap Trust uh, investments, and they were like 34,000. So we're, I definitely think we're on pace to remain that. APFs, very strong, we're up plus 60 at 3,700 a click. Uh, we hope that that remains in a positive environment to the rest of the year. And uh, this is a byproduct of two items. One is the uh, encumbrance that we carry over so that the uh, reserve fund balance has to not only uh, fund the fully funded balance at any given time, but it also has to have a component of liability for the items that were uh, presented in the budget but not completed by June 30th. And that was about a million five. Uh, you guys have, uh, were given at the last BNF and the governing board approved the annual fund transfer from the um, operating over to the reserve funds. That uh, should occur within October and that was about a million nine. So when those happen, then it'll move to uh, uh, an impact into the uh, reserve component. Here's your capital spend, 26,000 favorable variance at this juncture on the overall spend and uh, the allowances at 395 with still only about 30,000 spent. So I believe the outflows should uh, maintain well within that through the rest of the year. And down here is a very important number. Um, we exited out at about 59%, 58%. Um, and by the end of the year, we still anticipate to be 56% of the funds fully uh, against the fully funded balance. And um, the policies call for a 40% floor. And you can see that over time, we're, we're maintaining well above that. There is an allowance for new capital. There's a more allowances for uh, uh, just the general unanticipated. So uh, uh, I believe we're well positioned uh, if uh, as we exit out of this year, if things stay on track right now. Any questions for Pete on the uh, <laughs> capital? <laughs> um, I've noticed that we have, uh, you have in there, estimated increase in the APF fees for the next three years. Have you guys done any studies to correlate with other communities as to what they're doing with their APF fees, and how is that going to impact us? Uh, we are we were on a complete par. Sun City Grand and Sun City were both at the same 3,500 rate. Um, we moved, uh, advanced that, and they are on a calendar year, fiscal year, which is to say, upcoming in January 1st uh, is when they start their new year. I, we uh, have a quarterly meeting with them. Um, I didn't actually get whether or not they were anticipating to making a move. Um, but uh, I would argue that uh, um, we have not seen any slowdown in that due to that rate to variance. What about any of the other communities around us? Bend, uh, uh, the whole budget, yeah. Have you looked at any of those? 
No, I have not. I will have to get back to you on that. So. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? I have one. Okay. You have a line item in here called changing demographics. Point of reference to myself. What is the definition of the changing demographics? What are we, what are we budgeting for there? Yeah, uh, essentially when there is a dynamic within the association that's not really covered by the other six, and that's to say it's a, any kind of a default, but uh, the items that were placed in there in the prior year were, for example, the software uh, program for our charter clubs. And the idea there was um, they are uh, seeing a, a, a need to manage, manage their uh, membership as their, how much utilization they had in there. And so, especially coming out of COVID, it was deemed that that would be the place for you know, that uh, capital expense to be uh, placed, primarily because changing demographics is, is the concept of you know, <laughs> I, I guess I'm struggling with that a little bit, but uh, the, our, let, our let ages to, is changing and uh, things are coming up. And Let me try to assist a little yeah. bit there. In the world of demographic change, um, we have opportunities that present themselves to us during the course of a year that might not have a specific line item to adjust, so it allows for some allowances there for the general manager and staff to, to operate. In a case in point, um, a recent $3,000 expenditure allowed us to put some paint down on some tennis courts, allowing uh, tennis to still be played over at the Kuntz facility, but then opening up an additional six more pickleball courts due to the fact that those courts in various times of day and whatnot um, simply overrun the number of courts that we existingly have. So really a change in demographics there with a little bit of drop off in tennis and the continuing increase in pickleball allows us an opportunity to, to enhance our facilities, per se, during the course of a budget year with those types of allowances. Another case in point was the downplay in, in shuffleboard allowed us to implement a little bit of cash um, in renovating the, uh, the room uh, within our sports pavilion, allowing us to uh, uh, open up that um, Lizard Acres facility as another meeting room and, and shared space for others, that type of thing. Thank you. Any other questions? I want to back up just a moment before we have our next agenda item. And uh, it certainly helps when my mind slips to have a former board president here sitting next to me to remind me of things. But uh, we do need to get consensus on the um, August and September financials to uh, mark these as filed. So first we'll do the August. Do I have uh, consensus among my committee members to accept those? Thank you. And for the September. Thank you. And thank you, George. <laughs> I get lucky once in a while. You're right. Um, next, we are going to have Debbie with the ribbon. Is it Dorn? Thank you. With Ribbon Sew Club is going to give us a presentation. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie Dorn, 137872, member of the Rip and Soul Club and next year's president-elect. If you remember back to the start of the pandemic, our club made thousands of masks. I mean, our club was closed, but we sewed at home and provided masks for the community. This past summer, um, one of our newest members to join the club just celebrated her 94th birthday. And it, this month in October, we made and gifted over 60 quilts to Hospice of the Valley. I had the opportunity to sub for our president for three months this summer, and I spent a lot of time submitting CR12s for room maintenance. I always walk the CR12s over to the maintenance department, and I like to tell the guys that work there that we have a multi-million dollar facility, but our room does not reflect that. 
Sun City West was established in 1978, and the R.H. Johnson Social Hall opened in 1980. Our club was established in 1980. We have been here for almost 42 years, and our club may have been in the same room for 42 years. I'm not sure. I belong to other clubs, and I've noticed that the Kuntz classroom cabinets were resurfaced a few years ago for a fresher appearance. I also belong to a club at the Beardsley, and I noticed that the Beardsley Rec Center classrooms have been refurbished. This summer was my first summer here, because I used to be a snowbird, and I went to the Rip and Sew daily, and I wondered why we look so shabby. Well, I assume that these cabinets are original to the club, and they're beginning to show signs of their age. The cabinet doors are starting to deteriorate due to daily usage. More than a few cabinets have had their locks replaced several times, causing the MDF to fatigue. Many of the cabinet doors and trim have chips and cracks in the plastic laminate. The dark walnut colored cabinets are very outdated and give the room a dark basement like appearance. I strongly believe the Rip and Sew Club is overdue a refurbishment. The legacy of those original members is what I enjoy today. And the vision is for the next generation of members to enjoy 40 years from now. In conclusion, we are part of a multi-million dollar facility and going forward, our club should reflect that multi-million dollar look. Thank you, Debbie. Carl, do you have any financial information you can share with us? And Debbie, good presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to mention that uh, the Chartered Clubs Committee and the Properties Committee have both seen this presentation. Uh, they both have um, provided the governing board with a, um, a positive recommendation to move forward. Uh, I have mentioned in both of those committees that I will be asking the CFO to place $36,000 for this project into the budget. Um, the vendor that helped me do the research for this provided a, an estimate for 33128 so I assume that there will probably be some um, unknowns, so hence the $36,000. Uh, the club also requested upgrade to lighting and painting. If approved and we do a project like this, facilities maintenance generally does do a room repaint, so we'll, we'll touch up the room. And I'll also be placing um, a, a dollar amount for the continuation to R.H. Johnson, our last rec center to have the energy upgraded lighting system, uh, converting from our existing to LED. And uh, so that would be an automatic for that room in the FY22-23 year. Any questions? Um, at what uh, part of the calendar would you expect to do this, Carl? Uh, this project? Yes. I would consider this a summer of 22 project. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Any? I noticed in some of the pictures, your furniture, it's kind of like all plastic, the chairs and stuff like that and the tables. Have you put any money in the budget for new furniture? Because the 80s called and they want everything back. <laughs> well, we borrowed those chairs from the rec center, the blue ones. I said we put some more money in the budget for some new stuff. <laughs> Madam yeah, Treasurer. Madam Treasurer. Yes. Um, we're, we as a committee are looking to approve this to the general manager to include in next year's capital budget. We're not looking to approve 
the direct project today. Is that correct? That is correct. This will just be added to the budget for 22-23 if, um, if we approve it. And as Carl said, it has already gone to the chartered clubs and the um, properties committee. Properties, thank you. I drew a complete blank. Has gone to those committees. So what we do today is not a final decision and um, it would be included in the budget and then would be voted on later in the process. And, and to Anita's point on this one, that this is the starting point and there may be other things that would go into this as a completed project when it's presented to the governing board in at their normal that, budget process. That is correct. What Thank we're being you. asked to do today is just what is presented here, but there may be other things that would be included in it. Um, Anybody else from the committee have a Gary? Carl, is, uh, did you do a competitive bid on this? Is the thirty-three thousand the best bid, or did you did you not? For budget purposes, I do not go and okay. and reach out for three bids. We Thanks. find the mid midpoint, Thanks. and then that's, we can gauge. That's yep. good to know. Uh, Carl, could you speak to that, please? I never, I, I never mean this disrespectfully, but this is generally a, an operations thing. If the, the, the club has not requested these chairs, it's kind of uh, indifferent what you're asking, Anita. I appreciate it, so it'll be noted, and we'll discuss it with the properties committee and the staff, so, and the club, of course. But I think for purposes today, whatever we approve will be what has been proposed here. But thank you for the, the comments, and they can take it forward from there. John. Um, uh, I, I guess it's a comment. Uh, we've, over the last couple of years, we've received uh, a few re uh, presentations such as this, which was very well done, by the way. Uh, but I'm wondering if we would be better as a community if we took a more global or macro view of our rooms, uh, our craft rooms, uh, rather than dealing with these one at a time. And I don't know if this is something that we could ask the properties committee uh, to look at, but uh, w rather than piecemeal this thing and maybe end up with uh, different styles in different rooms, different times, I just wonder if it wouldn't make sense to take a more macro view uh, between now and, and when we do the budget uh, on it. It, it. Again, enhancing and maintaining our community is very, very important. But I think we want to have a look that's also uh, consistent across uh, the community. Uh, just a comment. Thank you, John. And I'm sure Carl will duly note that. Do you have any other comments, Carl? Um, Maybe to help answer that question, um, please re remember that in these rooms there are components from our reserve study tool of, of repair and replacement and a useful life. So uh, this room has experienced its um, carpet being upgraded in the last two years, so it is brand new carpet. Uh, the countertops have been replaced to brand new countertops last year. So um, cabinets are expensive. They are tracked as our asset component. We give them a much longer life. This particular cabinets um, have exceeded that clock, if you will. And so uh, at being conservative, the club is requesting and you're hearing the request. So um, I believe that the rooms are looked at that purview from properties every single year. Thank you, Carl. Do I have a consensus with the committee to move this forward into the budget process? Thank you very much. And Debbie, thank you. Next, we have uh, Margie Crantrell with the Clay Club to give a presentation. Good morning. Margie Cantrell, 1223-09. A big thanks to all of you for your service to our members and the residents of this community. I am the president of the Sun City West Clay Club, here to announce our membership 
has selected an all new, larger, improved design for a replacement monitor station and approved up to 100% of the estimated costs of $20,000 from club funds to pay for this project. Now we respectfully request your support for this desired monitor station for our club. Let me take a moment to recognize the committee who developed this plan. It was Debbie Wentz, Lee Phillips, who is with us today, Marianne Coates, and Barb Sloan that's here today. And I also want to publicly thank them for their commitment to our club and specifically this project. Clay Club membership over the last five years has averaged 365 members annually. Currently, we have over 340 with 70 residents on a waiting list to be trained and added to our membership. And we're working hard to help them do just that through our training processes. To date this year, we have executed now 16 new beginning hand building classes and tested in a potential members for a total of 75 brand new members, thanks to the tireless effort, efforts of our education department. Our current hours of operation are Monday, Friday, and Saturday, eight to four, and eight to eight, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays to give our members more choices as to when they can enjoy our, enjoy our facilities. The last time our facility was updated was 2014, when the Dickley Studio was completed as our educational room with additional use regularly by club members as well. Now I would like Lee Phillips, who helped design the layout and drew the monitor station to come forward and provide you the details of this project with, for your full consideration. He knows just about every inch of it and will be happy to answer structural questions. I'll come back up afterwards to help answer financial questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Well, thank you, Margie. Lee Phillips, uh, 128478. Uh, last year, based on comments from our club, uh, a study group was put together that Margie just mentioned. Uh, and we were asked to study two different things, basically. The first of these was where to store find a place for clay storage. We have a lot of clay, about 3,600 pounds of it we have to store. So that's an important issue. We wanted to get it out of the back uh, of the club where it had been stored and up closer to the monitor station for easier handling. The second item that we were asked to study was to evaluate the size of the monitor station itself because it was no longer really serving our needs. Uh, I'm going to show you six slides. The first three will be about the existing monitor station to give you a feel for what we're dealing with currently. The remaining three slides will be uh, our, show our proposal more, and hopefully this will help you give you the information you need to make a decision. This first slide right here shows the, is a floor plan of the existing monitor station. And as I figure out, there we are. Uh, oops. There we are. As the, um, the brown is the floor area, and the white uh, right in this area here is our current monitor station. It's about nine foot in width by about eight foot in length, 72 square feet. Uh, an important part of this slide is this arrow right down here in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, that's our current entry into the club, and as you come in, you'll notice that you don't really see the monitor station because it's on the other side of this wall. So this causes a great deal of confusion for people, delivering, guests, and so forth, coming into our club and wanting to know who to talk to. But it also causes confusion for the monitor in this area because the only way they see people coming in and out is through a small opening in that wall. So we're hoping, hoping to fix that situation, number one. Uh, could I have the, the oh, and our, I'll show you our current exit door is over here on the other side of this, uh, this room. What we're going to do, and I'll show you in one of the slides here coming up, is we're going to replace, switch those two, room, those two doors. So our exit door will become our new entry door and our current entry door will become the exit door. Could I have the next slide, please? This is a photograph of the existing monitor station. And this is it right here in this area. 
You can see by the amount of things stored on the countertop that our maid hasn't come in. Uh, and it always looks like that because it's just too small for all the things that we, um, we need it to do. In the lower right-hand corner over here, you'll see where we're currently storing our clay. And you'll notice that it's on, uh, ro on rolling carts. So that's an idea that's helped us maneuver the clay as needed. Next slide, please. This shows uh, the current monitor station from the end, and there's our clay storage. A little better picture of that. You can see again how cluttered that, lo that is. And there's actually a monitor in that station. Uh, you can just barely see the part of her head, again, because it's so uh, cramped and cluttered with, with things on the countertop. The next, uh, could I have the next uh, slide? Okay, those last three then were our current situation. Here's a sketch of our proposal. Uh, this is the new entry door now that I mentioned earlier had been switched with our exit door. So that's our new entry door. And as you come in now, as you can see, uh, the first thing that you see is the monitor station in this area. It's basically a U shape that's 21 feet long by 9 foot wide. Uh, it's about 185 square feet compared to the 82 that we had before. Uh, over in the back along that back wall under a counter is where we're storing the clay. And it's basically this amount of clay that has dictated the size of our monitor station. We have a place for a monitor up in the front here close to the door. That's a lower counter uh, to meet ADA requirements. And we have a second... Um, monitor station or monitor location, which I'll show you another picture of when we get to the floor plan, but over in this area here to serve the needs of the members as they purchase clay tools and so forth. Uh, one of the things that also we uh, would like to do as a club is the front face of this monitor station uh, we have set up for uh, a tile mural to be designed and built by the members so that as people come in the door, that's one of the first things they'll see, and it'll give them some idea of the things that we can do as a club. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, this is a floor plan of the, uh, the new monitor station. Here was our old entry door. It's now our exit door. And instead of having a wall between where people enter in the club, as I just mentioned in that sketch, here's our new entry door over here. So they're coming in very close to where one of the uh, two monitors, should we need to, uh, will be seated. Well, it's also our check-in area, which we have over here in this corner. And our second monitor seating area is over here on that longer uh, row of cabinet work that I just pointed out. Could we have the next uh, slide, please? This is a slide we took. Uh, it's kind of a cross-section of the cabinet work below the countertop to give an idea. And it shows the knee space for one monitor here, knee space for a second monitor over here, and then the rest of the area along these two lines of cabinet uh, or countertops are cabinet work for tool storage, paperwork storage, and so forth. Our clay storage is all along that back wall on movable carts. Uh, let's see, is there anything else on there? No, I think that... Uh, that should con conclude at least that portion of the, uh, my presentation. Are there any questions I could answer? Okay, I'll sum up then actually with just one last paragraph. This proposal allows for two workstations, tool storage, upgrades electrical, it permits expanded monitor training space that we need, and, allows, and follows rec center recommendations for ADA approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Margie? Thanks, Lee. You let him off too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, we are respectfully seeking financial uh, support from the rec center to allow for a possible upgrade to solid countertops for this project. The monies that the club has voted on was for laminate countertops. It is my understanding in the past that there have been times when the clubs have been worked with to enhance the project a little bit, depending on what uh, the clubs want and what 
the uh, Carl's committee deems is probably a better idea. Maybe um, the layout, maybe a, a, like another solid countertop and that kind of thing. And that's what we're seeking from this group today. Um, do you have any questions on the finances for us, how we're going to fund this? It's out of current funding. It's not money to be raised. It is out of current funds that we have as a club. And uh, we have saved some money in our accounts uh, for possible future projects. For example, we have a small area in the back. If you've been to the Clay Club, we have a glazing area. There is a uh, non-load-bearing wall there that closes in a small room coming in off the back patio. A nice enhancement for us down the road to consider as a club would be ask that that wall be removed and we open up the glazing area for much more use because right now only two or three members can be back there at a time. And we also hope that sometime uh, down the line with the use justifications that possibly there's something else. So we're trying not to use up all of our funds, but we're using up a sizable chunk of them. Thank you, Margie. Um, we have not seen the total ask on this. Carl, do you want to speak to that? Margie, we might need you again. <laughs> I know, coming up here. I forgot. He sits over there. Um, there. I'd first like to start um, with uh, Charter to Clubs and Properties. Again, has seen this presentation. They have both given favorable uh, recommendations to the governing board. Um, from a budgetary standpoint, I am asking the CFO to add $30,000 for the Clay Club Monitor Station. Um, and my reasoning for that is I have gone out for um, um, budget bids for this and multiple ideas and rent renditions of this uh, monitor station and um, uh, the club is correct. We are within the, their $20,000 request. Uh, there are flooring repairs that are necessary after doing a remodel like this and the wiring and in case there's any incidentals. I suggest that we do solid surface countertops as opposed to laminate due to the useful life. The, the increased cost is worth it. It lasts much longer. So $30,000 is what I ask to be placed in the budget. So just to summarize, $30,000 is the total of this project. The Clay Club has in hand $20,000 that they will put toward this, making a net um, effect to Sun City, the rec centers of Sun City West of $10,000. Uh, to summarize, too, for my committee, the full 30000 would go into the budget because that is the amount that would be depreciated, and then we would get the uh, donation from the Clay Club. So I will open it up to questions from uh, the committee. Uh, there, <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of discussion at the workshop about the... Uh, bookkeeping on this, and I think that's been resolved. Um, but we've also heard a number of groups come forward with proposals, uh, some making contributions, others expected based on the normal life cycle, Carl, uh, of things to automatically be replaced. It, it seems to me we've never really created a policy or a resolution to distinguish one versus the other, to be consistent in what the clubs can expect in terms of support versus whether they have enough money to contribute to the project to make it more viable. Am I off base with that? I would say that I'm not the subject matter expert on this, so. Sorry, Bill. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Well, per perhaps uh, <laughs> while, Bill, while Bill is uh, getting ready, I could interject a comment that uh, I agree with uh, Gary's thing. I, I, I think more consistency and uh, a, a, a public uh, view would add, it would take a lot of confusion away from a lot of things and, and do nothing but help. And we could certainly look at policy language, but I think where we got ourselves into, um, this is kind of a little bit of a recovery program. And, and, and so when we're talking about equity and fair, um, that's really the bottom line when it comes to you know, how we fund projects. When it comes to chartered clubs, 
Um, I think it's our responsibility to make sure that these facilities are um, adequately equipped for them. And then over time, we have the responsibility to adequately maintain these, these things. That's going on. That, that exists every day here. I think where we kind of got out of line um, back when clubs were generating their own revenues outside of direct membership dues, um, things were getting leapfrogged and things were taking place that, that really kind of were out of compliance when it came to IE tax code and how we were really operating. So it became a little bit out of balance when it came to fairness. Um, and so that, I think, has all been reeled in. Um, we now look at uh, projects as they come forward, um, and we utilize you know, the subject and the philosophy of need versus want, um, more so than how, you know, as how these things get funded. Really, numbers tend to play out for us. All the input and the new, um, all the digitized um, data that we can now collect from clubs as far as usage and those types of things really provide, I think, the, the governing board some pretty solid basis as far as us making recommendations moving forward as to adequate need. And then when the clubs do have specific wants, per se, that's what their membership dues can help offset. And so we just have to get the train back on that track moving forward. But I think policy-wise, we're there. But we can certainly take a look. If we have to tweak some language in those policies to kind of clean things up, we certainly can. But I think we're moving in the right direction. It just would appear that it's one of those, uh, if I've got some money and can support the project, I have a better chance of having it approved than if I don't. And as you know, a number of clubs <clears throat> don't have the ability to raise a lot of funds to be able to support that. So Absolutely. it just allows for an inconsistency that I think they don't understand. Yep. Thank you. Lisa Vines. Lisa is a member of our governing board. And I'm short. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I, Margie, I, this is probably for you. I just have a question. Um, having been at several of, of the other Charter Club Committee presentations that y'all have done, um, I think at one of them I remember hearing that uh, one of the factors that may have played into um, moving the clay to the front near the monitor station may have had something to do with um, some uh, possible stealing of the clay, um, yeah, and if that factored in at all to this, um, that creates maybe a want versus a need. I don't know, did that play into this at all? Um, I, I would like you to address that as well. To answer your question, Lisa, yes, that played into it a lot in that we had some numbers that reflected there possibly could have been theft, it could have been an inventory issue, for example, uh, clay is our most fluid inventory we have. We've bought over $10,000 worth of it this year already. And it comes in and it goes out. And sometimes the way we account for it is difficult in that, for example, when we have a beginning hand building class, there may be four to five students in the class. Each one of them gets a free bag, gets a bag of clay that was included in their purchase of that class. But if for some reason somebody forgets to write down that they took five bags out of the inventory, then perhaps the inventory doesn't show that movement. The other thing that happens is people come in and they'll buy two boxes of clay, but they leave three bags. There's two bags in a box. They leave three bags in the inventory so they don't have to take it home because they weigh 25 pounds a bag. So therefore, when you go to count the inventory, you sold four bags, but, only, but there's still three in there. And it's... So it's been difficult over the years to actually surmise what's happened. So yes, there was some question there about inventories and how we take care of them. We try our best, but we're not, I always say we're not 30-somethings. Sometimes we forget our, you know, what we're doing with inventory and somebody might say, oh, I forgot my $15 today. Can I owe it to you tomorrow? And then I don't think anything was done intentionally, but perhaps we didn't get the $15. I don't know, but it was very much in part of this vote for the membership. They made the consideration when they chose between two different um, suggestions, how and where we would put the clay. And this was definitely voted on by our membership, and that was what we wanted to have happen at the club, that it was a membership choice and a membership choice to spend the money. Does that answer your question? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Obviously an excellent presentation. Thank, thank you. you. I do want to tell you thank you very much for allowing the club to be here. And uh, we look forward to having our project move forward as quick as possible. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank and you, I, Carl, too. I think it's obvious that this is a club that is definitely using their space given the hours that they have. And uh, one of these days when I'm not in my current volunteer job, I hope I can become one of those people on your waiting list. <laughs> uh, if there's no other discussion within the committee, do I have a consensus that this would move forward to be included in the 2022-23 budget? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to talk about the budget timeline. That's Pete's. Up next. Thank you again, Ann. Uh, the rec center policies request your committee approve the uh, budget timeline, as you see up here. FI 15 predominantly, the policy FI 15 predominantly creates the expectations of the uh, budget committee and what uh, needs to be presented by CFO or or the general manager throughout the uh, two month uh, the FY 22-23 process. As you just saw uh, with our last two presenters, the uh, FY 22-23 budget's already begun. Staff um, continues to review our reserve study components flagged as being uh, replacement ready by the RS um, reserve study for that year. This clearly does not automatically result in it being included in the capital budget as each item is evaluated for the need to replace. And also staff has new projects that uh, emerge for operational or safety purposes that will be presented as we move forward. In early December, the GM and CFO establish many of the broad assumptions for the budget. And then our accounting staff and CFO work with the managers to compute a budget. Your committee actually represents the kickoff for the uh, formal operating and capital presentations in mid-February. Thank you. And uh, there's, uh, throughout the, after you guys uh, get the initial presentation, there are workshops with the governing board, more meetings with you all, public forums. So edits uh, continue to occur over the uh, next three months, resulting in um, approval in the May um, governing board meeting, a regular meeting. And um, that's the broad assumptions. I did not choose to uh, go each line item. I think I did that a year ago, and many of you are. <laughs> Our repeat, so I thought I'd compress that with that broad overview, but I, I welcome any questions you may have on either the broad assumptions or any line items. Other than the dates, has anything changed? Uh, no, not tremendously, yeah. For those of you who are new to the committee, like such as Richard and Anita, I'm sure you've been through this process before on the governing board, but you'll see that this is a lengthy process. We actually will not be addressing anything more in it unless there are other charter club um, requests that would come before us. But we we don't look at this until in February when we see the first um, go around of it, and then we'll be in, intensely involved from that that point on. So spring is when our work happens, but right now Pete and. Cliff and the accounting department is going to be doing a lot of work. So, have any questions, suggestions, anything? This is just an information only, so uh, thank you very much, Pete. Uh, Pete, we're going to talk about employee health insurance plan education. Thank you again, Ann. A uh, little bit. Uh, Disappointing, but not necessarily unexpected. The current year, our total premiums were a million six thirty-two. Uh, the we are our health insurance is administered through Cigna. Uh, 
they go off of uh, actual claims history and uh, we had almost three or four claims that exceeded over 100,000 individually. So we had, as uh, I pointed out here in this next one, we had on line one here, almost 125% of the premiums we paid in the, in the current year it, um, exceeded the premiums paid. So Cigna was not unexpected to come back with a rate increase request. Um, our broker is Hayes and Cigna initially had about a 25 and a half percent uh, rate request increase. Uh, given that I will bring it up in a few minutes that we have had a seven year history with Cigna, uh, they were willing to uh, decline that to 19.99%, but that was the, uh, the best they would offer. So there are components of our premiums. 61%, uh, as I mentioned, comes off of the actual experience. The rest is on a national average, which had some impact from COVID, but uh, on, a, uh, on a factual interpretation of what our you know, premium was, they applied a 61% was just due to that uh, heavy amount of claims history. So um, the second thing is our demographics of the workplace, um, it, it's, it does tend to be uh, older uh, with, when we factor in a lot of the part-time positions, but the part-timers are not covered by our health insurance. We pretty much the full-timers have an option. I think about 20% of our full-time people have uh, insurance through another uh, person, whether that's a spouse or, or Medicare. And then uh, lastly, the trend line is, is actually uh, pretty good still. We had seven years, as I said, of history. In 2016, there was a 7% hike, and I won't read off every year. Then it was 4%, 1.2, 1.0, 0.0. So I'd call those the, uh, the great years that you know we were not seeing any um, impact. 9.9% last year, and then the 19.9 you're seeing presented. The seven-year average then is actually pretty modest, you know, as I've seen against other national averages, 6.2%. So uh, it's disappointing, but, you know, that's why we have health insurance for our, for our staff. And sometimes there are claims history years like this that cause an impact. Um, question. Um, when we did the budget this year, did we budget mm -hmm. for the starting January 1st for any increase in the health insurance premiums? Yes, I did put a 10% hike out there. So yeah. we're going to have just another another 10% on to the yeah. budget for those first six months yeah. of 2022. Uh, another question is, a rate increase sometimes uh, makes us want to look at what our um, employee contributions are. Have we done anything about employee contributions? Do, do the employees have a copay on this? Yeah, this is a, an 80-20 policy. Uh, of the so if the, if the premium goes up for us, it's also going up for yeah. the 20% for the employees. Yes. Uh, uh, I wasn't necessarily uh, prepared to present this next statement today, but the... Um, <clears throat> There are three components to uh, employee pay that means something to them, which is their annual eval, which uh, generally speaking is capped at 3%. Then there's also the timing of when we give those out. And for those that don't know, when we were in the COVID year, we were really not sure of what was gonna be impacting um, the revenues or even any of the expenses. It was a lot of unknowns. And so the annual increases historically for um, our full-timers was in July. And when all the minimum wage slash <coughs> part-timers were done on July, January 1st, as mandated by the minimum wage requirements. So it kind of made sense uh, 
But just to be clear, our, our employees did experience a six month lag in 2020. The last component is just overall inflation. And I think Social Security just recently announced 5.2% premium incre or a percentage increase in the uh, benefits. The um, three components that I just mentioned, inflation, the delay, and then the cap at 3% was being evaluated as, you know, you hit January 1st and thank you for that percent. And now health insurance sucks you for another 19.9%. So as Bill uh, Schwind has alluded to many times, we're wonderful facilities and everything, but a, a big component of our association is our staff. And it was evaluated at, um, recently that the 19 or 0.9% would essentially erode all of the um, wage increase that they were gonna hit plus inflation. We calculated and made a conscious decision, uh, calculated decision that the increase at that time would probably result in a significant amount of departures. We we have about a, I think, uh, don't hold me this, I'll have to get with HR, but I think it was in the 15% turnover rate normally. And the cost to replace people is considerable. Um, we spend thousands of dollars. I came from healthcare and it was $50,000 to replace an RN. You can imagine what that would be for, uh, maybe not to that level, but it's considerable for any of our full-time positions. So uh, we did make a, an effort and a decision to lower the percentage that was gonna be impacted onto our staff. Um, and that went from the 20, 80, 20 down to, I think we chose 85%. Um, that is within the general manager's authority. Uh, he has $50,000 and the impact into the budget for January to June was about 47,000. And so that was a decision because we think that hitting with all three would have resulted in a considerable amount of departures. And we believe it'll pay off many more times in, in employee uh, retention. Um, do, do we apply that same percentage to the family plan if an employee is covering the family? Yeah, I uh, had uh, a year ago, I went into greater detail. I'm giving you rough numbers here, but a, a current year, uh, roughly in a, a single employee is in the five, six hundred dollar range for the premium that's component of the million six. We have four grids. We have employee, we have employee plus spouse slash significant other. You have um, family coverage or no coverage. As I said earlier, no coverage is about 20%. The uh, single and family member is about 60% as you'd expect. Uh, family rates uh, and get up to around $1,800 for the premium. So those, in, you know, with family are paying roughly $300, $350. And so uh, imposing a 19, 20% hike on those or 20% on the person who's paying these uh, $100 or so on an employee only, uh, they were watching couple of hours of work go just for the increase alone. And so, as I said, hit that with capped uh, rate increases, inflation hitting them. We, uh, we believe this was the right strategy. Well, I, you know, I also came from healthcare, so I'm familiar with doing a lot of insurance negotiations. And I know that sometimes um, a married couple will look to which one of them can have the better insurance deal, you know, whether, whether the, um, the, this, this spouse is covered or does the coverage or this spouse, this other spouse does the coverage. So I just, um, I was just asking those questions as far as those things go. Um, 
do some of my other committee members have any questions or comments to make? Richard? Yeah, I just guess, right. If I understand you correctly, this 19.99, is that a one-off because of the COVID, or is this somehow a, a larger component of the trend? More specific to us. More specific uh, to a us. broader scale, there's a lot of people that perceive COVID as being the driver. I came from healthcare, 30-plus mm -hmm. years in there, and COVID, uh, they get the, it gets the front and center about the 50-day stay in the ICU and the claim history, and that can be significant. But what you also saw, and many of my CFO, CEO friends, and they're still in the business, they went in for months of no uh, elective procedures, you know, so orthopedic and uh, scopes and things like that were heavily delayed. And so the premiums, or excuse me, the claims history on the broader one, you always hear about COVID, but it was offset by a, a pretty significant decline in those spends. But overall, what we did see was about a seven to 9% national average. So we're, we are impacted by the 19.99 because 61% of our claims history factors into the reason for the request by Cigna to uh, recover their losses, you know, from a, a heavy spend. So, but as I said, they did recognize not only this year, but a year ago, uh, it was a higher percentage than the 9.9 .9 we settled on. It, I believe it was upwards of 20%, and then all those zeros and 1% hikes, you know, convinced them that uh, this was a, a client worthy of a lower rate. Well, it happened again. And so we lose, you know, our ability to negotiate that when we when we have these claims history. You know. Did did we look at any change in our um, coverage, like higher deductibles or any type of things like that, that might um, assist us in any way? Yes, uh, uh, there was about a hundred or two hundred dollar annual deductible increase that possibly would have moved the premium down, I think, by only a point. Like it was 19.99 declining to uh, 17 or 16 percent would have had the effect of, uh, or been driven by increasing the co-pays. Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we were going to go the other direction in terms of what I brought up is that, is that the time to be, you know, Putting more on to the to the staff. That's essentially what it was. It wasn't like um, the, the the Cigna was doing it for any kind of um, positive reason. They just said, "Hey, if, if the employees are bearing more, we'll we'll lower our premium." But that goes back to our discussion on an eighty twenty. Uh, I have a a question. Before that, I'll make a statement that uh, healthcare. Costs are going up. Insurance is going up. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you and others have are doing a very good job of managing it. the the uh, the information you were able to convey uh, goes far beyond any of the questions I would have thought of. So uh, my hat's off and uh, compliment that you're trying your best to manage an area that's uh, a significant cost to the community and. You're doing it very, very well. The simple question is, how many employees are covered? It, it, even approximately, no, you don't need to uh, be We do specific. have a rough, thank you, John, for your compliment, by the way. Um, and we got a tremendous amount of managers who make our income statement what it is every month. Uh, we, we look for cost savings wherever we can. In this, uh, um, I lost my train of thought, but uh, hang on. the number. Yeah, no, yes, I'm sorry. I knew I was going to say it. 140 uh, was roughly the number, and we have like 175 full timers that are eligible. So. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Audience. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Bill, you're next on the agenda.
clean up and thank you for your time. Um, as we were kind of dealing with the 501C7s and C3s and, and the tax situation that we've been going through for the last half a year or so, um, a couple of things have come up. Obviously, we've had 103 to 105 clubs um, doing a variety of things, from selling crafts to just being normal uh, card playing groups and or uh, C3s that are out there fundraising and doing things um, that are allowable under the tax code um, based on whatever kind of tax alliance you are, your club is um, aligned with. So one of the things that has come to light that we're just trying to do a little bit of mop up on is lo our loans that have taken place over the last several years that, that uh, need to be looked at. Um, within our bylaws, basically, you know, the general manager is, has the power to ensure that records are kept in accordance with gap funding and, and gap accounting and that type of thing, and we do. Um, we get audited every year, and I think those, those audit reports available to you all prove the fact that we are in pretty good financial shape. But it also um, states that this, this board, um, as well as the governing board, provide oversight of the administration, the operation of the association, and some day-to-day -day operations, obviously decisions under $50,000, can be left up to the general manager. So with that being said, there are some things that have come to surface I'd like to just share with you to be transparent as best we can um, when it comes to uh, several loans dealing with a few clubs, be it pickleball, tennis, and stained glass. Years ago, um, the pickleball club um, entered into an agreement and contract with the association um, for over $300,000 for the assistance in getting 18 courts built out at Palm Ridge. Uh, to date, they've been paying back um, those funds as the contract had uh, detailed. And as we sit here today, um, we're about 76,000 $854.24 to be exact, as far as a balance owed to us. Um, in compliance with the IRS, the way the, the pickleball club was bringing in money was the sale of advertising during tournaments and outside play and outside people coming in contributing to that club to help offset that amount. That is not viewed well in the eyes of the IRS when it comes to code compliance for a 501c7. So that's been stopped. Um, however, there is an outstanding balance. So in looking at the entire pickleball club situation, there's a couple of things that currently exist. And a couple of them are naming rights contracts that we have. The association does allow for that. Um, however, by policy and, and rule, those contracts typically are allowable from the general manager to do in one year basis. If that contract needs to be extended um, for longer than a year, the governing board then would have an opportunity to vote on that. But the way our policies and bylaws are written, it, it basically allows the governing board to approve long-term contracts like that to three years. What has happened in the past, um, I can't really answer on, I have not been here, but. I do have a contract, not in front of me, but there are naming rights contracts for both the Sands Courts as well as the Liberty Courts um, that extend a three-year period. And in so, there is revenue continuing to come into the association um, now to offset those loans. So over time, um, as, these, as these agreements, naming right agreements exist, the $76,000 will be paid off. So that's a good thing. Um, however, uh, we can do the math on that. Whoever's around in 2038 will see the balance of those <laughs> loans go away. So it'll take a little time. But those, th there's money coming in to offset that. So pickleball, I think, is good. So let's enter into a little bit more of these contracts and talk about the subject of force majeure. Right? These, there's little clauses in these contracts so if any extenuating circumstances come to rise, either party has an opportunity to basically say timeout. You know, things have changed. I can no longer fulfill my obligation. And that kind of is what exists with tennis and stained glass today. So in 2016, um, 
The Rec Center Association advanced the tennis club $57,155 for the addition of new tennis court where three pickleballs and a platform tennis court existed. So that got moved out, I believe, with the Sands project and the new tennis courts were installed over there for 57 grand. And then the tennis court, uh, the tennis club made an initial $25,000 payment on that and they continued to pay off the balance. In doing so, they too entered into a naming rights agreement with Mimo's Cafe. That's been going on for a while. And every year, the, the Mimo's pays the association $4,000. And so as we sit here today, um, the contract at, with Mimo's expires in 2023. So there's another $8,000 coming in to us that would leave a balance to the, to the tennis club of about $9,155. Again, advertising was the main method of replacing those, that debt for the loans, hanging ads on their fences and those types of things. No longer does the club do that due to their tax status. So we're proposing that the $9,155 gets forgiven, force majeure, right? You can't do that anymore, time out. And the same thing really for stained glass. A couple of years ago, uh, 20, 2018, I believe, stained glass during our um, um, space allocation program that was going on demonstrated a need for expansion. 1,500 square feet was added to the stained glass facility for their club. That's been built, that's been paid for through our, our budgeting process. And the club then agreed to reimburse the association 50,000 of those dollars. To date, uh, the stained glass club has contributed $20,000 towards that debt, leaving $30,000 open. Um, as 501c7s, again, with the closure of the village store, the sale of stained glass and those crafts being made at that club was their, was their primary source, if not all their source, for generating money back to the association. So essentially, um, again, utilizing the force majeure in the agreement, things have changed. We just want to move forward, clean things up in our accounting scenario, forgive this particular loan, and move forward. That is the recommendation coming from the general manager and our staff going through you from a transparency perspective, hoping I'll answer any questions you like, but I, I'm moving this forward um, uh, for the governing board, of, again, for review. But as we sit here today with the policies and bylaws that currently exist, it is in within our purview to do so, and we're making that recommendation from a general manager's perspective. Thank you, Bill. W one question, has the Stained Glass Club been asked to contribute any money, excess monies they might have in their uh, treasury at the moment? We have not. We have just due to a fairness situation. If they want to contribute, they certainly can. I have not talked to Gene. I did tell Gene that we were moving forward to this forgiveness program as well as tennis um, regarding that 9,000. I'm not certain of their current accounts what their balances are, I, I do not know, um, but I certainly could could reach out to them for that. I just think we could give them an opportunity to <laughs> and, uh, share. Certainly. I will clarify, uh, we will check with them. I, I, I want to give them some credit. Um, the letter of understanding for the 50,000 commitment was initiated at the uh, completion of the project. And that was in late 2019. They were given one, a 10 year cycle to pay that off. Mm -hmm. You can do the math, 5,000 a year. They didn't have to pay until November of 20. And they paid it like within a week after signing that commitment. They then got ahead of it again prior to the COVID impact. And I will say surprisingly, in, with all of the impacts that Bill just referenced, then they made another $10,000 payment. So they are literally three, if not two and a half years ahead of their commitment, which would have only served to increase the amount that Bill would be asking for today. So I'd argue that they're, they've made a, you know, a noble effort. And, and I appreciate that. I just, just doing my due diligence is- uh, Absolutely. You know, what I need to do for, for, for our community. Um, 
uh, let me ask you this. Is this, these amounts, we're talking about, as I see it, $39,155 total for the uh, tennis and stained glass. Is that correct? correct? Yes, ma'am. Is this currently carried as a receivable on our books? Yes. So if this is written off, will this, this will go against our revenue for this year, correct? Yes. Okay. Another question I have is these clubs with their tax status, are they going to have to claim income for loan forgiveness? If so, have, have we looked into any implications they may have as far as tax liabilities? The, this, is a, this is a subject that is still under um, review from our attorney as well as a, a CPA that we're basically, we have a list of, of issues that have come up again with the 103 clubs that we have that are being assessed and that is one of them. Okay. And so we will have an answer to that moving forward. But yeah, yeah those are concerns. <coughs> Absolutely. Okay. And yeah, so we're gonna get a triple check on that, but a reminder that the contract, uh, Bill's correct in the force majeure, but you're just basically authorizing the write down. That could occur at the, for tennis, for example, in 2023. And who knows what their, you know, tax status would be. Not, not that it's changing or anything, but they could anticipate that. Uh, we don't have to make that entry today. Does that make sense? We're, it we're it curious, does. So. I'm, I'm also wondering, are we getting this today for information only? Or are you wanting some type of action from our committee? Well, if, I mean, if some kind of recommendation, I'm not sure it's ultra necessary, but I think just being as open as we possibly can for questions, answers, and, you know, moving forward, I think would be appreciated. Sure. And I think right. it... I, I understand that. I just wondered what, what your expectation was from mm -hmm. us today. I know I've got other committee members who have questions, so, Anita? I know that when we're looking at the big fish, the IRS, we also have to look at the little fish as well, because Arizona follows tax. So you also have another tax uh, liability for that perspective as well. Thank you. This is all of them, no more. So the other question, I guess, to the earlier conversation, if they came to you today for this stained glass improvement to the facility, how would it be approached? Just like the presentations you heard earlier today, <laughs> right? They would, show, they would show need based on number of people and those types of things, square footage and the fact that they've got a waiting list and people can't get in and all those any, all those metrics that we would look at as far as moving forward. But they wouldn't have to come up with any money of good faith no. to convince you to, 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 to support the validity of the project. Correct. It's the same thing if their air conditioners go out or those types of things. We take care of that. I've got a couple of questions here. Um, $9,000 sounds like a lot. And they've lost their revenue stream, obviously, from advertising. Right. What about assessments? How many members do they actually have? I mean, we're going to go to the community and say, hey, we have to forgive these loans. Correct. Have we done a full assessment going back to their membership and saying, if you have 900 members, it's $100 a piece or something like that, $10 a piece? Okay. Okay. So how are, we, how are we determining that they can't pay? How they can't pay? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you have $9,000 that's owed by, say, the tennis courts. Any, I wouldn't say they can't pay. I think any club could pay. Simply raise your fees, um, right? Because right. clubs are limited now to their, their revenue generation comes from membership dues. Mm -hmm. So if the wood shop wants a new table saw, right, their whatever they pay a year, $25 a year by the number of members, gives them their operating budget for the year and they can buy new blades and they do whatever maintenance they need on their equipment as far as the operations of that club go. So if they know that they need, you know, 10 new saws and they want to budget for that, then they bump their fees up. These are, these are independent clubs. We don't control them in any way other than provide them a venue in which to operate. These are, these are individual 
501c7 organizations that we have somehow partnered with as far as these loans go a while ago. And so from a fairness perspective, you know, if, if the way that they were anticipating paying these things back, primarily with advertising and the sale of crafts, that's been removed from their operation. So just in a sense of fairness, we're just saying the fact that this is, this is money spent um, and we're just trying to clean up the books on that and move forward at this point and just start treating all the clubs as fairly as we know how, right? Okay. I'm always reluctant to write off a loan. I, I was in the banking industry, et cetera. When you came in and said, hey, I want to forgive a loan, it was a, an assessment done saying, well, what revenue streams do you have and can you come up with additional revenue streams? Right. And we have, for instance, the Auto Restoration Club um, currently has over $500,000 in a balance of a loan. But they're a 501c3. They operate differently than a c7. So their, their ways of generating revenue and contributing hasn't changed. So they're still liable for that funding. Okay. What has changed is the fact that you know, the, the getting back into compliance with the IRS and the sale of their crafts or the sale of advertising basically you know, puts them at risk essentially with compliance relative to their tax code. And we don't want to basically cause any of that. We don't want to be anywhere involved with any of that from our associations level. And we're just trying to clean this up. Okay, thank you. George. Uh, one of the things is, is, is when we look at these clubs, like uh, Bill said, they're individual 501c7 uh, groups. Uh, with stained glasses particularly, we have taken away their ability to earn dollars that was there before. And it's, I think, uh, we need to look at it in that sense is that compliance has a problem. It's a two-edged sword that goes with it. And I think that it's the right thing to do. Um, yeah, immediate, not immediately, but again, they have a lot of legalese to go through there. But as an FYI, this is the right thing to do for that club. I believe that. Thank you. John. Uh, thank <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, what you're proposing is, uh, is more than reasonable. Uh, I think it's uh, <laughs> facing reality. If they have no ability to pay, sooner or later, you're going to have to face that. And I think you're just doing it in a very responsible way and doing it quickly. So I think the community benefits. Uh, if this were to, to be put to my judgment alone, I would highly support what you've suggested. So uh, the order of magnitude of these write-offs seems to be very much consistent with the support that uh, the community gives to all the other craft clubs of that type. Uh, it, it, it certainly passes a smell test as far as equity uh, amongst uh, all the members of the community. Uh, I think we had gotten into a number of, uh, shall we say, bizarre practices and behaviors with getting clubs to, uh, to pony up some money uh, to favor their jobs, and I, I don't think that was really healthy anyway. So uh, my hats go off to uh, the originators of this idea, and I'm, uh, I'm on board. I appreciate that, John. And, and, and I just want to you know, let you know we will sit down with these club presidents and reach out to do whatever we can to recoup whatever we can to kind of reduce this load. Yeah, I, I just think it's our due diligence to at least you know, go to them and talk to them about it and not just take it as a fait accompli that they, that they just can't pay it. Yeah, consider but, that, consider uh, that done. Yes, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, do, you, do you want anything else from this committee other than the comments you've heard? Um, if, if, if the board would like to just vote for a formal recommendation and move forward and continue, that'd be terrific. Well, we're asked for a formal recommendation. Does anyone want to make a motion that we move this forward? Oh, no motions. Never mind. No motions. Consensus. Yes. <laughs> Do we have consensus? I'll just go one by one. 
Yes, okay. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. We have consensus. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, I didn't ask if there were any other comments from board members or members of the audience. Okay. Um, as you recall, at the last meeting, we talked about the committee goals, and um, I have not heard from anyone else about any goals other than the, the goals that are put before us each year, one of them being to review our policies. And I had asked for a, a review of policies um, um, 01, FI 01, 02, and 03. I did not put those on the agenda today because we already had a lengthy agenda. So I have gotten a couple of suggestions from people on those, and those will go on our next meeting, which is currently scheduled to be the 2nd of um, November, if we have sufficient business to discuss at that time. So I have not forgotten about those, those policies. I also have talked with Deb Long and the accounting department. I believe um, John Hobold got to be quite familiar with Deb and her department last year talking about some of the asset preservation fees and some of our policies. But Deb is very good at looking at the fluidity of some of these policies and when changes need to be made. And um, she has already told me that she will have something for us in November, she'll have an update on where we are, where the REDS pro program is. REDS being the program that looks at um, transactions that are made that don't ordinarily flow through the um, um, normal real estate transactions, the way we usually see them with realtors, where those funds get collected automatically. And she's able to go back and find those. And it's been very lucrative for us. We pay a a percentage, I believe, don't we, for, or we pay a fee for those, but it has more than paid for itself. You want, yeah, you she'll give a detail, but the five-second version is that REDS uh, gives the county uh, deed changes. Uh, anything that's recorded with a Sun City West address is communicated as a day-end file folder to answer, or I should be Deb's attention. And then she, many of them have no bearing, but those that uh, actually impact. And by the way, uh, your, you know, your um, agreement with the rec centers of Sun City West stipulate that you will communicate a title change. Uh, not many are aware of that and, and actually do that. So it's it's not only money, and we believe that this is bringing. Um, immediate impact for the status because the last thing we really like to do is to go back and say you added somebody on the title four years ago and it, it happens quite a bit more than you think and you never told us now here are four years of dues you had an APF involved that's not very um, amenable either so every year that goes by we're bringing more and more currency to it and I, I think that's a good thing. It's, it's yeah. not all just about the money. Well, I've asked Deb to look at any policies that she sees immediately that we might need to address. So we will be, over the course of the next few months, we will be looking at all our policies. Ma Ma yes, Ma George. Madam Treasurer, uh, just quick uh, for Pete, real round numbers, because I'm taking notes of me. Cost of the REDS program for a year? Yeah. yeah Approximately. 700 a month, so... Uh, my math that says okay, that. I, I can I can figure that out. If she and how much a recoup do we get? Uh, through we started in February of 2020. Uh, I think it's just past 700. Or 700. 700 k. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And it's just to clarify, it's not all APF. I just mentioned a second ago that if mm. you find it, you you'll have a transfer fee, you have dues involved, but uh, APFs are a component of it. So. That's. Thank you. So I just wanted to bring you up to date on on those goals. Um, another goal that I have is to get a secretary for this group. And as those of you who were here, who were here last month, the volunteers were underwhelming. So <laughs> Kathy Linton got uh, assigned. And um, we are going right now, unless somebody would like to volunteer. I'm still taking volunteers if anybody mm -hmm. wants. I'll even train them. <laughs> um, we are going in re reverse alphabetical order. <laughs> we, 
<laughs> which means, Richard, you're going to be the last one now that you've come in at the very end. Um, George was, uh, well, I'll give you time to get used to being on the committee, too, and reading the minutes. Uh, George <laughs> got volunteered for this month. And I'm proud to do it. For, for this meeting. And um, John, you're up next. Okay. So um, the, the goal is right now to meet the 2nd of November, but as I said, that will be depending on how much business we have to come before the committee. George, do you have to Madam Treasurer, I'm just going to, uh, to the committee and to all, the minutes will be a little farther behind since I'm waiting for a new word processor to arrive today. Thank you. Because uh, as I politely put it, my word processor concurrently is on hospice. <laughs> well, our, our sympathies to your word processor. Um, do I have any comments from the committee? We'll just go around, starting with John. No. George. Richard? Gary? Anita? Okay, no. any comments from our audience? You've been a very attentive audience, and I appreciate you sticking with us for a longer than normal meeting. And with that, at 11.16 a.m., George, we are adjourned. Thank you all so much for your attendance.